Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, how much time do I have? Like, really? Oh, nice. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, this topic here, barriers to completion in a healthy professional culture at a community college. I'll give you a little context. Again, my name is Derek Smith. I'm an associate professor of educational leadership at the University of San Francisco in the School of Education. Um, I'm the co-director of our high school, excuse me, our K through 12 school principal training program, uh, professor of our uh, East Asian Regional Consortium of Overseas Schools, Council of Overseas Schools program. Uh, and I also do work in our master's and doctoral programs, of course, in addition to training higher education student affairs professionals. All right, so what does that mean? Well, to most people, nothing, um, which is fine, because uh, most people uh, are not in, in uh, our profession, and for the most part, I don't expect them to care much about what we do. It's more about how we contribute to their lives and what we do in our society. Um, as my uh, colleagues out of the United States just so eloquently presented on the issues facing the city of Philadelphia, you'll find that those issues are rampant across the United States, and thus it is quite logical for a very violent country that kills thousands to handgun homicides, uh, has a very incredible uh, <clears throat> crime rate overall, sexual assault rates, etc. There's a good reason why people wouldn't care what academics do. <laughs> um, and so I'll talk a little bit about context here. Um, so this is the state of California in the United States. How many of you have heard of the state of California? OK, great. Whatever you heard is a lie. OK. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, a lot of people think it's beaches and surfers. Um, and nothing but fun in the sun. But as you can see here, the left side of the photo, that's where the ocean is, on the left side of the photo. Everyone else doesn't live by the ocean, OK? So, so most people don't surf. Um, most people, it's too much sun. I'm sorry, I'm talking very loud. Um, most people, it's too much sun, OK? And it burns you, OK? Um, but what I'm showing here is a map of our community college system, OK? The state of California, one of 50 of, uh, US uh, states, one of the larger US states, has 117 community colleges in it, an additional 114 private and faith-based, meaning religious-based colleges. We also have the illustrious and prestigious University of California system, where Cal Berkeley, UCLA, and uh, eight other campuses are in that system. And then we have another 23 California State University campuses. OK, you don't have to remember all that. Why would I tell you all that? It's because that's a lot of colleges for one state, OK? But the community colleges are the largest system, and they educate the most students, yet they are often discussed the least. Okay, There's a lot of politicized reasons why that is. I won't go into all of them. But to provide you some context, the study I will be presenting for the next few minutes um, is on a particular community college. Now, if you can follow me here, in the United States, like uh, some other Western um, locations, in the United States, we have these different levels of higher education. The community colleges in the state of California are two-year institutions okay, that serve as transfer points to the four-year universities that I mentioned earlier, the University of California system the California State University system, and the private universities. So these colleges here, these 117 colleges, serve as one, a transfer location for those universities, and two, a training space for trades and basic skills. OK, why is that important? Well, because the great University of California system 
with Cal Berkeley and UCLA and UC Irvine and Riverside, they uh, serve about 190,000 students. The California State University System, San Jose State University, San Francisco State University, they serve just under 600,000 students. This system here serves 2 million students a year. Why is this significant? Okay, now I'm gonna bore you a little bit more than how I just bored you. We're gonna go a deeper level of boredom, but it's very important, okay? The state of California has a very interesting policy that in the 1960s and 70s was seen as both a political opportunity in conservative circles and a political opportunity in more liberal circles for social change or the maintenance of a social order, okay? Let me be quicker, I have to be quicker, quicker. Okay, so the California state, state, state of California has a policy that says the community colleges, the California state universities, and the University of California each have particular roles in the state's systems of education. To make it very simple, the University of California is supposed to serve the top 10% of high school graduates. The California State University system is supposed to say, uh, serve the top 33% of high school graduates. Raise your hand if you're following me so far. Oh, thank you, great. All right, I used to teach high school. This is usually when high school students would, okay, okay, I'm done, all right. But what is most important here is these 117 colleges by state policy in 1960 were established to quote, serve all those who may benefit from instruction. <laughs> Everyone, okay. So from the conservative perspective, it's a great structure because it helps keep all the poor people away from the people with privilege and better education. But to those of us on the left, I wasn't alive then, <clears throat> but for those of us who are on the left, we see it as a persistent opportunity to provide education to all those with less privilege. All right, so that should give you just a little bit of context here. So what we're gonna talk about is one of these colleges. I won't tell you which college because what I'm gonna tell you is, hmm, it's a contentious issue that could get me in a lot of trouble. So that's what I study, things that could get me in a lot of trouble. So next year, I might not have a job, okay. <laughs> so we're gonna be talking about one of these college, colleges I called Metro College. At the time of the study, Metro College served 90,000 students, making it the largest college in the state and the largest college in the western part of the entire United States, excuse me, largest community college, okay? 100,000, 90,000 students. It had 10 campuses across its one city, okay? And it's part of the system that I just took so long to explain. Okay, so over a decade ago, the board of trustees of this college determined that the college wasn't very good at graduating students. Okay. Now, what is very important about this is this what we call an equity gap, that you found that African Americans, such as myself, Native Americans, Filipino, Latino, Pacific Islander, and Southeast Asian transfer rates that were 19 to 21% lower than other groups, meaning that students were uh, disproportionately not being able to transfer to the other universities or graduate. Okay, so what happened was a bunch of people got together and said, well, we wanna figure out why that is, okay? So some researchers were commissioned. Myself was one of them. We worked with colleagues from Stanford University and the John Gardner Center. We also worked with a couple of organizations, Harder, Com Harder and Company, and another organization to do student focus groups to figure out what were the barriers to success at this college. Okay, is this making sense so far? Okay, so, so these were the main aims of the study. 
we wanted to engage folks in a discussion about how these issues were occurring. Two, we want to identify the institutional barriers uh, and the potential contributing factors. And three, we actually wanted to assist them in planning a way to improve. All right. Now, what's funny is, well, that's not funny. What's interesting is while we started doing this study, okay, this particular college came under a threat to lose its accreditation from the state while we were doing the study. And this created a big upheaval for several reasons. Okay, but let me get into who the participants were. So we interviewed over 50 faculty, staff, and administrators, okay? Deans, department chairs, adjunct faculty, counselors, coordinators, and other Metro College personnel that worked at five of the 10 campuses were interviewed. Participants represented a range of tenure from 30 years to one year. So we interviewed people that just got there and we interviewed people that had been there, what they felt often was too long, okay? All participants were informed that their names and positions would not be associated with their comments. The reason why this is, okay, you have to understand, okay, you don't have to understand. Let me explain, okay. California, for better or for worse, is known as a liberal voting state in the United States, okay? Uh, it's not full of leftists, it's just that um, many of the urban locations with higher populations have high uh, democratic levels of voting. Uh, once you get into rural areas, it's, that's not so much the case, okay? But where this college was located is in a very politically left-leaning area, okay? So as soon as they got the word that they might lose their accreditation, the messaging was that you're coming after us because we are leftists and we are interested in social justice. All right. So then when we're commissioned as researchers to come in, they're saying all you're going to find is that the people at the state level are after us because we believe in social justice and leftist principles. Okay. And I told them, so do I. So I hope that they're just coming after you for no reason. But that's not what happened at all. Okay. So what we did was we interviewed all these folks, um, asking them various questions. It was semi-structured interviews. Uh, uh, we didn't use snowball stamp sampling. We used purposive sampling because we wanted to make sure that we identified people from different aspects of the staff and of the faculty. So we didn't just we, we couldn't just get people to send folks to us because that way we might never get a dean or we might never get a vice principal. Or excuse me, a vice president. We might just get folks from certain departments. Okay. The reason why the interviews were semi-structured as well, and there's a um, I don't know if they, we allow this in in um, in methodological discussions, but there was a slight twinge of ethnographic interviewing going on because what. What ends up happening when you're, when you're asking people about their job and why their workplace is not successful, you start to lean into the sense making that they do of their work and their world. What does their work mean to them? What do they feel about being here? So while we had these interview questions, it went all over the place. I'll tell you one thing, we had to start bringing tissue with us because people started crying in our interviews. I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm an educational professor. I don't know what to do when you start crying, all right? But it happened quite a bit. And these were some of the reasons why. When we interviewed, and remember, we interviewed all staff and faculty, okay? Some of which were actually former students themselves, okay? And this is one of the first things that came up is that one of the barriers to students being able to graduate, wait, you know what? I didn't even go over that enough. You, wait a minute, I didn't even go over that enough. When we're talking about community college graduation, it's a two-year college, okay? Two years, okay? When the state compiles completion data by college, they measure each cohort on a six-year completion 
term, uh, term, six years. That's three times the time they're supposed to graduate in, okay? Even at measuring for six years, almost no community college in the state of California graduates people above 70%. Okay. Even with six years, can you imagine if you went to college for four years and, in, and when they assessed the graduation rate, they did it over a 12 year period and still nobody graduated? That would be nuts. OK. All right. So one of the things that we found was there was a communal loss of trust in the matriculation at the college, meaning that one of the reasons why students didn't succeed is because students had no real way of knowing how to actually succeed. Meaning that when you told someone, take this class, then take that class, it almost never worked. So what happened was folks started inventing alternative pathways, almost like, um, almost like, um, like underground crime syndicates, you know? Like you had to go to somebody who knew somebody that knew somebody that could get you into a course that might be able to matriculate you faster. For example, the head of the math department had 5,000 students on the waiting list. Uh, let me say that again. The head of the math department, which is a basic skills in the United States, is a basic skill sequence. You have to pass math and English in the United States in a community college to be able to move forward towards your transfer classes. So for the, to get into the math classes, they had 5,000 students on the waiting list. Okay, that's the structure, all right? So what that means is to get access to courses, you might have to take one course a year to matriculate through, to move through your basic skills before you take college transferable courses. So if I got six classes to take in math and I can only take one a year, how many years is going to take me to get through math? Six in a two-year college. Are y'all following this? Okay, excellent. All right, so they called it the back door. I had to learn the back door, okay? Keep me on time here because you know how I get 10 minutes? Oh, really? Okay, cool. All right. Second thing, what we deemed, what, what, what was deemed by the uh, faculty and the staff as a quote unquote political culture. Now, for my international colleagues, this might sound a little strange uh, uh, because I feel that my international colleagues, no disrespect, I don't know if you guys feel this way sometimes too, but sometimes our international colleagues are just smarter. Um, see, U.S., you know what I'm talking about. Our international colleagues tend to be smarter around these things, okay? Um, I don't know if you've been following U.S. politics, but anyway, okay. So political, in quotes, meaning that there are, there's so uh, many dynamics of relationships and power to navigate that it's hard for people to do their job properly. Okay, and I have I have two things up here. One that we found a lot of multi-partisan conflict. Now this sounds nuts, okay? But it says very few respondents who have been involved in campus policy development view the culture around policy innovation, vetting, or approval in a positive light. And part of this is because of the poor communication and coordination. Groups form silos for the purpose of protection in the perceived political environment of the college. All right, look, this is hard to do in 20 minutes, but you have to understand how ridiculous this is. Listen to an example, okay? We had two faculty members that were running to be on one of the advisory boards of the college. You following me? Okay. What they did was they recruited students to help them campaign for their position, okay? This, this is not what we normally do, okay? Don't think all U.S. professors do this. This is nuts, okay? All right. And so what students started to do was um, vandalize pictures of the opposing faculty in the hallways of the buildings and then spread flyers, this, this is literally fly on paper, not online, flyers listing all the horrible aspects of that faculty member's career. All 
right? Okay, this wasn't done once. This was done multiple times over a series of years, okay? Yeah, it's a community <laughs> college, right? Okay, and, and so what you end up with is um, folks beginning to create these protective silos. Uh, uh, myself and my colleagues from Stanford, uh, and it, we, we called it, uh, uh, there's a show in the States, uh, you might have seen it called The Game of Thrones. Okay, um, it's like everyone's spe speaking in these European accents. You know, Americans love European accents. You know, it's probably because we don't really speak English well. But anyhow, um, anyhow, point is, is that we called it a Game of Thrones. And so when certain administrators and faculty would get jobs at this institution, one of the first things they would be told informally is who their enemies are. Okay. Now, I used to teach in San Quentin State Prison in the United States. Uh, I teach in it, teach in the prison. I wasn't in the prison. I used to teach in the prison. And what it reminded me of was prison politics. Okay, when you get here, you're one of us. And a lot of these things were organized by race, right? So if you were Latino, hey, once you get in here, the blacks and the Asians are going to try to take with all the resources. Right? This is a college, okay? Believe it or not. Okay, let me finish up here. Um, the equivocation of leadership, ex am I done? Okay, I'm stopping. Equ equivocation of leadership expectations. There wasn't any clarity on what the mission was at the college. Um, there were very little discussion about ethics or purpose whatsoever, all right? And as I mentioned, the, concre the concretized silos, well, the silos would get formed, meaning that people would form these Game of Thrones, oh, people would form these Game of Thrones collectives to defend themselves. But then administration, instead of providing conflict resolution, okay, would just write the division into the policies of the campus. So for example, they had a counseling office, counseling, counseling to help students, counseling, okay? And there was a conflict between two counselors. And then uh, different crews of counselors got behind each counselor. So there was a war. Instead of resolving the conflict, the dean's office, along with the vice uh, president, decided to create two counseling offices. <laughs> a new counseling for new students and a traditional counseling for continuing students. And at the time of the study, those two offices had never met. So new student counseling would pass students on to continuing students with no discussion at all. Mind you, remember, 90,000 students, largest campus uh, west of the United States. OK. All right, so there are some retention program challenges that I could get into. But why would I bring all this up? Why would I bring these things up? Because if we're talking about how institutions handle crisis, now for this particular institution, the loss of accreditation became a crisis, okay? They, they were threatened with two, two years to fix their problems or lose their accreditation. They actually use this study to help fix their problems. I am proud to report that they did not fix their problems, okay? <laughs> so my study was not super helpful. So for those of you that are budding researchers and consultants, please don't assume that once people read your work and work with it and study it and dissect it, that they know what to do with it. Okay, that's not always the case. But last thing, I'm going to close with this last thing. Uh, thank you, sorry. So I'm going to close with this last um, point, is that they were facing a crisis, and so they wanted to launch into action to fix the crisis. But their estimation of what constituted crisis was limited and shallow. Their institution was purposed for the matriculation and graduation of students. And they hadn't done it well for years. They never saw that as a crisis. So when the accreditation, a threat to the institution's existence came up, they were poorly prepared to respond to that crisis 
because they didn't understand what was truly a problem to begin with, okay? And one of the things, I got booed when I presented this, by the way. They booed me, and then they listened, but they booed first. Because one of the things I said is that when you have 90,000 students, you have about 10,000 African-American students. You graduated 10 last year. 10. And I said, so full circle, with that data, do you actually think the state needs a political excuse to come after you? And if you were truly interested in social justice and resistance, there's no way you would allow yourself to be in this position in the first place. Okay, that's it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much.